Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 2024 horror prequel, The First Omen. Now, this is a film that has honestly not really piqued my interest that much. Uh, when the trailer dropped, I wasn't really that enthusiastic about it. I was like, really? An Omen prequel? Who is asking for this? Why do we need one? And I saw the trailer and it left me even more underwhelmed about the prospect of an Omen prequel. And then the film came out and it started to get all these really positive reviews. And the movie was getting all these reviews that were singing its praises and talking about how it's a really good prequel and it's a great companion piece of the Omen. And it's also a great standalone horror film. And then it actually did sort of uh, interest me. And then I saw a film. And after it was over, I was just like, really? This is what everyone is being so hyped about? This? This is, the, this is one of the best horror films of the year? This is a film that is significantly better than a similar film, an Immaculate, that came out around the same time? This? And if you feel that way, cool. If you love the film, cool. I don't have a problem with that. I think that's great. Different opinions are what keeps this world interesting. But I definitely agree to disagree when it comes to this film's almost overwhelming praise. Uh, to me personally, it's not a bad movie. It's just a below average movie for me. It's another one of those films where it's well shot it's technically well made. There's a couple decent performances here and there by the cast. And there's a handful of scenes that aren't uh, too bad and are actually pretty solid. But for the most part, it's pretty forgettable. For the most part, it's pretty dull. And there are other elements of it that are honestly pretty egregious. Now, the film is directed by Arkasha Stevenson, and I think her direction is pretty dang good. I think it's a well-directed film. It's got a good sense of visual style and flair. I think the director definitely has some genuine talent, and it shows. Uh, there's some great-looking shots in this film. The uh, sequence that takes place in uh, the uh, disco sort of club. I think that's what it, it's more like a club, but like the, the club scene, the way it was shot, the way it was lit was pretty impressive. There were a few other sequences, like some of the really intense birth scenes and stuff like that, that happened near the end of the movie. And a few other, uh, sequences that involved, uh, hallucinations or nightmares or, or other, uh, elements of horror, definitely uh were rather chilling and had a good amount of creepy mood and atmosphere and i feel that the director definitely had a good handle on different uh types of camera techniques to utilize as well as different uh styles of filmmaking it is in a lot of ways a, a really uh effective film from a directorial standpoint visually i would say the direction is the most consistent thing about this film quality wise, other than the cinematography, the screenplay though, by Tim Smith, our cautious Stevenson and Keith Thomas to me is very inconsistent in terms of its quality. And it's honestly the biggest reason why the film just falls relatively flat for me. And the reason for that is for one, it's a really bad Omen prequel. And I think that this is something that is not being discussed enough when it comes to this film's uh, uh, critical uh, uh, current reputation or, or people's uh, discussions of it when it comes to a critical lens. Because if this is any other film and it made the same mistakes, I'm pretty sure that it would get uh, it would get roasted for that. And I, I don't quite get why 
it's absolutely awful writing when it comes to connecting it to the omen is getting such a pass in fact i'm seeing all these critics say that it's a great omen prequel and i'm like how it's a great omen prequel if you never saw the omen which i honestly feel the writers of this might not have done because that's the only explanation i can think of when it comes to why certain decisions were made other than them just changing things out of spite. And I, I, I would say that some people are probably wondering at this point, like, what do you mean by this? Well, before I go really in depth in terms of why I feel this way, I'm going to say there's a ton of spoilers here. The only way that I can really explain this is to spoil pretty much every major uh, a twist or, or plot point when it comes to this film. So if you haven't seen the film yet and you don't want things spoiled, I would say uh, click off, watch the video at a later point, because at this point on, I'm just going to be going into pure spoiler mode. So in the original The Omen, in the 1976 film by Richard Donner, there is a scene featuring uh, Gregory Peck and David Warner's characters where they are at this graveyard in Italy and they find these two graves and they dig up. Well, they don't necessarily dig up the bodies. They, they, they lift the stones off the, the uh, graves and, and see what is inside. And there is, at that point, a big reveal that the mother of Damien, the mother of the Antichrist, is a jackal. And you even see the skeleton of a jackal in the grave. And after that, there's that whole bit where Gregory Peck's uh, character, Robert Thorne, goes in and digs up the other grave and finds the dead uh, remains of what was his son with his head bashed in. So the whole point of that scene is to provide that big reveal, that big shock that the, the, the rambling crazy priest who was talking about who Damien's mother was to Robert earlier in the movie was actually correct and that Damien was born from a jackal. That was the whole point of that scene. In the first omen, the writers decide, nah, Damien was born of a jackal, but it was a bipedal, uh, uh, wear jackal kind of thing. And it was a male jackal who impregnated a woman and Damien's mother was just a regular woman. Well, not really a regular woman. It was a woman that was uh, created uh, out of certain uh, uh, strands of DNA to try to uh, bring about uh, the Antichrist. But because of the fact that it wasn't a male, that it's not the Antichrist, it's just some other devil child. And so that was the whole point of the first omen is to try to just, oh, we're going to make it so, yeah, Damien was born of a jackal, but his mother was an actual woman. But the twist is that she's a woman of the devil, too. And to me, that does completely undermine the omen. And it makes it a really bad prequel to the omen. Because, no, it... it Damien was born from a jackal, from a female jackal. That's the whole point of it. That's the whole point of that scene in the graveyard. Why would that scene exist? And why would this organization within the church, why would they go through the trouble of burying a jackal corpse? If the intent was to try to cover something up, like what? why, why would they even do that? Like, why couldn't they just be like, oh, there's nothing there? 
we, we, we're not even going to put anything in there. So it just, I just, it just frustrates me. It really does. Because I think it's a really, really bad prequel to The Omen because of that. Because it just takes something that's simple but pretty horrifying, the concept that a human child was born from an animal and then overcomplicates it. And then changes things to the point where now the 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 omen doesn't make any sense. The graveyard scene doesn't really fit within the new uh, confines of the story that the writers of the first omen are trying to create. And it doesn't stop there. The character of Father Brennan, for instance, in the omen. He is intended to be a disciple of the devil who turned uh, 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 against Satan and has turned to his faith. That is the whole, he's turned to faith in God. Like, that's the whole point of him having 666 on his thigh. That's the whole point of everything. That he's supposed to be a man who, because of the circumstances in his life, because he's dying. Uh, he is now turning back to God. And that's why he says things. I've sinned against you, Father. I've did not done all of this and so on and so forth. He was once a regular priest, but then he became a disciple of the devil. And then he turned uh, back to his faith uh, by the time that he's involved in the events of the omen. That's the whole point of the character of Father Brennan. That's why he's warning Robert Thorne in terms of who Damien is. In the first Omen, Father Brennan is written as just a regular priest who wasn't actually a part of this satanic cult or this group that was trying to bring about the rise of the Antichrist. In fact, it's kind of insinuated that he might be in the same boat as, as some of the other uh, uh, failed experiments or something to try to birth the Antichrist. But if that's the case, he's a man. So why isn't he the Antichrist? Because it's, it's just, there's too many questions that are now brought up because of the decisions by the writers to change so many things. And it doesn't stop there. It's also really incompetent in terms of how it ties things together with the omen. There's a whole bit near the end of the first omen that is supposed to establish that Robert Thorne is going to be the father of the Antichrist. They even show a photo of Gregory Peck from the omen to really uh, allow this to sink in. But there is a line of dialogue or some sort of narration that you hear that talks about Robert Thorne being the ambassador to Great Britain. Now, some people think, well, he is. Not at this point. This is supposed to be a prequel. And Robert Thorne was never the uh, ambassador to Great Britain until Damien was five years old. So by, by insinuating and saying that he's already the ambassador... That's pretty incompetent, and that really does show that you can't even get basic details correct, which is a really bad sign when it comes to trying to write a prequel, and a sign of a bad script when it comes to writing a prequel. So not only do you have the stuff with the jackal, and now they make it overly complicated with this demon jackal thing, human hybrid, whatever the hell it is, that's impregnating these women and gets burned in the end at the same church that burned down uh, that Damien was supposedly born uh, in. You not only have that, but you also have the stuff with Father Brennan, and then you have this stuff with, with, uh, with uh, Robert Thorne and his status as an american ambassador it was just an easy thing to change just make oh he's a, a rich uh, uh um potential uh, uh politician you know not exactly that wording but you get what i mean like you have a line of dialogue that just says oh he's very affluent and he has a lot of money and a lot of power and influence 
and potential to maybe be the ambassador of Great Britain in the future for for the United States. You don't have to just say he already is. That just is really lazy writing and just shows that you're not paying attention to details. And also with the stuff with the Jackal, I know this is trippy and weird, but why doesn't the film just have uh, the, the mother, Margaret, turn into a jackal and then give birth to Damien? That would make it so it still fits within the timeline of the Omen and still actually fits as a prequel to the Omen. And it doesn't undermine the Omen because it doesn't want to go there and thinks it's too silly. We're talking about a film that franchise that is not even remotely close to being real or anything that is honestly in the scope of reality. So what is really the, what, what's the problem with her turning into a jackal and then giving birth to Damien? Oh, people who haven't seen the original, they would just not be confused. They would be confused and like, will be like, why is she turning into a jackal? What, what is happening? That's their problem. It's supposed to be a prequel to the Omen. It's not supposed to be a standalone film, which speaking of that, I think this film would have been better if it was a standalone film because the worst aspects of it are that it's an Omen prequel. The fact that it's an Omen prequel also hurts the film when it comes to the pacing and the scenes where it's just dragging things out, trying to set up this reveal this shocking reveal that Margaret is the mother of Damien. It's not shocking. It's predictable. And the fact that the movie's taking so goddamn long to get to that point gets to be kind of annoying. And if it was not an Omen prequel, then that wouldn't be as big of an issue because now it's just a standalone story. Now... I've criticized certain elements of the film and I'm not done. There are some other things that I, that I want to talk about as well. And, and I want to criticize, but I do want to give this script some credit in some capacity. I think it does a good job with character development. Does a good job establishing Margaret and her character, why she's going to Italy, what she is trying to accomplish there. It does a good job really establishing her as an outcast and in a lot of ways making you sympathize with her. And, and, and it does a good job with the mystery when it comes to what's happening at this church and the, the, the mysterious different people that are staying there that act strange. And there, there's a, there, there's a lot going on there that is rather effective when it comes to the more mysterious, more eerie elements of the the script and, and the overall story. I also feel the idea of multiple failed attempts to try to bring about the Antichrist and the investigation into that was, uh, was honestly really well done. And I thought it was some of the creepiest moments in the film was when you're, uh, being shown those photos of all the failed uh, attempts to uh, birth the Antichrist. But there are other things about the script that just really uh, don't work for me. And a lot of it is the Omen stuff, uh, which I, I, I just feel is tacked on. A prime example of that is the scene where one of the the nuns at the church uh, kills herself and she does the whole, it's all for you. And she kills herself by hanging herself. But now she also lights herself on fire, which then just makes it into ludicrous, laughable overkill. And I'm like, okay, it's the same death scene as the nanny or the housekeeper in the omen, the same setup, the same way it's shot. The only difference is, is that the girl lights herself on fire, but it's still the same. So I'm like, why? Why don't you just have her stand on top of the the, uh, the roof and light herself on fire and jump off to her death? Why does she also have to hang herself? Oh, 
because it's supposed to be a prequel to the omen it's supposed to be connected to the omen but you connect it to the omen in the weakest possible way in ways that either don't make sense or in ways that just hurt the film because you're like well that just is forced and it just feels like the movie and the story just stops at that moment to just be like hey remember this from the omen and the story is also pretty bad when it comes to having too many moments of just really cheap scares like there's a there's a scene early on where margaret is staying in this room and it's at night and she hung some stuff on a wall and she is freaked out and is is uneasy and on edge and then she looks towards the wall and then sees a nun and the nun even makes some kind of weird noise and there's other moments like that in the screenplay that are just really tired and really lame attempts at jump scares and it's funny to me because this is a film that i've seen a lot of reviews say it doesn't have lazy jump scares what are we talking about what film did you watch just because this film has scenes where it doesn't feature lazy jump scares that doesn't mean that it doesn't have them it has a fair amount of them especially in the first half of the movie there's even scenes where people are sneaking up on other characters and then you get a music sting or they speak really loudly the start the start of the audience but speaking of scares when you get to the birth scene at the end or when you get to some of the different sort of stuff with the underground cult that's working uh in the church and what they're doing uh uh behind closed doors and when you get to some moments like that, it, it's pretty creepy, fairly effective. Reminded me in some ways of something you might see in a Cronenberg movie. There definitely were some body horror elements. Um, There's also some other inspiration from other films like Possession, for instance. Although when it comes to Possession, I think it's just a flat out rip off. Uh, it, it's, it's, it goes far beyond the point of homage because there's a whole scene where margaret is having a freak out and it looks like it's just copied and pasted from possession right down to the way that it's written and how it's shot um and the screenplay does suffer from a lack of engaging characters other than the lead like ralph Innocent's character father Brennan like they're trying but he's not really in the film a lot starts out with him and it seems like he might be utilized more but he's not which honestly I feel was was uh, uh, a missed opportunity because I think the character father Brennan being uh, fleshed out more would definitely be a lot more interesting than dragging stuff out with Margaret and then having stuff with uh sisters uh, uh uh silva or some of these other you know women these other nuns that are uh in some way you know befriending margaret or and 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 stuff like that um or the the or the fa or father gabriel who uh you think he's actually one thing, but he's really is really something else entirely. Um, but I but I do think the stuff with Carlita, I I do feel that that is interesting. I do feel the writing with that character, I think that works. That's something that definitely does provide some some moments of of. Uh, intrigue when it comes to the plot and the story um and and i don't mind some of the, some of the stuff with luz and her character and and her semen uh, her seemingly uh, uh genuine friendship with uh margaret now the ending of the film 
here's the thing. I, I, I get what they're trying to go for, but I don't think it really works that well, especially when you're trying to tie it into the omen and even the twist where it's revealing that the church itself is sanctioning these experiments to try to give birth to the antichrist because they want people to turn back to the church. Even that I feel is a massive stretch. Like when that was revealed, I was, I rolled my eyes. I was like, really? You're going to go there. And that's another thing that undermines the omen. The whole intent of the Omen trilogy and everything that's supposed to happen after this is that it's a clandestine underground group that works within the church and works outside of the church for the best interests of the Antichrist. It's a satanic cult. That's the whole point of it. It's not a Christian cult of Christians who decide to bring about the rise of the Antichrist because they want people to turn to God more. Like, that's not at all what is the intent of the Omen and the group of people that Miss Baylock or some of these other people are supposed to represent or be a part of in this series. The idea of having a, a church a sanction group that's working for the Catholic Church to bring about the rise of the Antichrist, that's not a bad concept or an idea. It's just a bad fit for the Omen. So that's why it shouldn't have been an Omen movie. Just be your own film and then you can really uh, work with that more. But as an Omen film, it's, it's another element that just undermines the Omen in, in, a, in frustrating fashion, to be honest. And the idea that Margaret gives birth to twins, okay, all right. Did it have to be twins? No, it seems like the only reason why there are twins is so you can set up another sequel. So you can use this as a, as a platform for another Omen franchise. But this time around, it's the Omen prequel trilogy. So you're going to have the second Omen and then the third Omen. And you're going to retcon other things and just completely wreck the timeline of the Omen films. I mean, the, the, the ending of this film is like something straight out of a Marvel movie. I thought I was watching a mid credit scene from a Marvel film with Margaret and her daughter, uh, and uh, the other girl that she rescued and she's staying with them and Brendan comes in and finds her and warns her that they're going to be coming for you and she's all like, well, I'm ready. I'm like, so now she's going to turn into like uh, Sarah Connor and protect her family from, uh, the, the, from uh, assassins who are sent to kill her and her family by the church. Is that what we're going to do in the sequel? I just, I just don't get why this screenplay is just getting nothing but praise for the most part when it genuinely is a bad prequel to the omen for the reasons that I detailed. And even some of the elements that, are interesting or somewhat all right they're also kind of derivative of other things at times or they're not really living up to their full potential or some of the scenes just feel like it's padding like the stuff with this other guy that she met at the club and this whole scene with him and the the sequence where the car hits him and then margaret is holding his half of his body that whole scene was dragged out way too long to the point where it was honestly kind of uh, um, ridiculous to me, especially when it comes to the tone of the scene. It's another element of the script that I think is lacking. The tone is just very inconsistent. There's a lot of moments where, okay, it's actually fairly intense and kind of creepy. And then there's other moments where it's taking itself too seriously to the point where it's laughable. And... Yeah, it's just one of those screenplays that I, I do. I genuinely feel it's a disappointment. And I'm like one of the few people that feel that way. I think one of the reasons why it's kind of getting 
somewhat of a pass from other critics is the fact that it deals with women's reproductive rights. I think that's really what it is. They, they, they don't want to get canceled for whatever reason. Uh, so they're just kind of giving it a pass and I'm not in that boat. I'm not going to give it a pass just because it discusses something like that, that so many other films have discussed elements uh, of that subtext in, in many different forms and in many different uh, uh, ways in the past. This isn't something 100% you knew unique or new. It's not like it's groundbreaking. It's not like it's having discussions about reproductive rights in some new way that we've never seen before. So just because it's opening up a discussion about that, I don't really feel that that's something that deserves abject praise i i just don't even the 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 performances by the cast are kind of hit and miss for me like nell T tiger free i would say her sonia braga uh ralph innocent um and um maria cabarero uh those i i think those actors do a relative good job with their performances they're pretty authentic i think they're pretty uh strong i think some are stronger than others i think nell tiger free at times she's kind of forcing it a little and some of the emotion that she's expressing i don't necessarily buy um so i don't think her performance was as much of a revelation for me as it is for other people but i still think it was a good performance uh, but I do think that it was a bit inconsistent at times. Ralph Ennison, he wasn't in it a lot, but what the scenes that he was in, he definitely had a presence to him. And uh, I, I feel it was a really good casting choice because I bought him as being Father Brennan. Uh, Sonia Braga, I mean, she's just a legend. She's great. A really good casting to play this, uh, in a lot of ways, a slithery uh, nun in Sister Silva. Um, Bill Nighy, Tafik Barholm, uh, they were there. Maria Cavalera, like I said, as Luz, I I thought she did a really good job. I thought her and Nell had some really great chemistry, and it was nice to see Charles dance again. But he's not really in the film that much. Oh, I also want to uh, uh point out Nicole Saras as Carlita. I also thought that was a pretty uh, decent performance as well. Um, but there's a lot of things involving the story and the script and just the overall film itself that, that hurt some of these performances because of just how overwrought some of it is and how it takes itself too seriously. So it leads to a lot of scenes that I think are intended to be, uh, nerve rattling or they're intended to be unsettling, but it just comes across as awkward and, that really hurts some of these performances because for the most part, I think they're rather authentic, but then there are moments like that where it becomes the opposite of authentic and it becomes inauthentic and it becomes forced and it becomes, uh, something that, it, that is nowhere near as effective. And speaking of effective, I think the cinematography is effective. I think it's a well shot film. I think the look of it is rather consistent by Aaron Morton. I think the editing by Bob Murawski and Amy E. Duddleston is also pretty uh, decent and is definitely not bad. I, I don't think it's a, an, an instance of horrible editing, but I, I don't think it's award worthy either. I've seen better editing in, in horror films, but it's still good for what it is. The music by Mark Corvin, though, I didn't care for it. At all. I thought the score also hurt this film because at times it was too overbearing and there were attempts to try to create sort of a choral uh, 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 feel to it like the Omen, but the attempts here are just laughable and over the top, like a, a, an all-female choir warbling at the top of their lungs and, to, and it just reminded me of the Exorcist 2 score. You know, in The Exorcist 2, where the score is just over the top, that's what it reminded me of. And that's not a good thing when your score is reminding someone of Exorcist 2, the heretic. And it's got 100, 
119 minute uh, runtime, and I do feel it drags. I was actually pretty bored with the film for a good chunk of the movie because it just takes its sweet time trying to develop the twist in terms of Margaret realizing that she is one of the the experiments and she has a 666 on her skull and she's the one that's going to give birth to the Antichrist. I'm like, why did you take over an hour of the film to get to that point? It's so blatantly obvious. I was even talking aloud in the theater where she's like, who is it? Who is this 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 other uh 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 Siana? It's you. And then she, she does the whole thing where they're at forehead and it's like, oh my god, it's me. I'm like, yeah, no shit. So yeah, I, I don't get it. I do not understand why this is some new gem of horror. Like I I am perfectly content with never watching this again. Uh to me it was just as forgettable and and bland as a lot of other unnecessary horror prequels or sequels. Um and I honestly liked the A&E show that lasted for one season and Damien a lot more than this. And heck, I had more fun with the pilot episode for the 1995 Omen series with William Sadler that barely has any connection to the Omen, but at least it was a well-paced, fairly well-written pilot episode that had some genuine tension. I I don't know where the tension was in this. That that I saw all these critics talking about, because for the most part, it was non-existent. I was just looking at the film like, okay, there's some decent performances. That's a nice looking shot. Okay, all right. That's kind of creepy. That's kind of weird. Then you get to the ending, and you're like, okay, that's that's pretty trippy. And then then it's over, and you're like, okay, all right. That's not a masterpiece, (laughs) but that's just, that's just my take on the first omen. Anyway, thanks for watching my review of the film. And as always, I'll see you later. See ya.